I, I, I wrote my book about two weeks of return. When I got to the chapter that uh, discusses part eight, uh, I think the opening paragraph, something like, there was the Twin Peaks before Part 8, and there was the Twin Peaks after Part 8. Because when Part 8 hits, everything we knew about it, now we have to rethink and re, you know, evaluate. And, and then you know, we go from there into sort of a, a new world uh, of what Twin Peaks is now. Um, I don't think I need to tell you what happened in Part 8. <laughs> I'm sure is there anyone here who doesn't know about Part 8, uh, you know... Uh, Essentially, what happens is that we, we get an origin story and we, we get some backstory to this universe that we, we, we at, up until then, we were pretty certain we knew what was what. Uh, and, and then, now we, again, we had to kind of rethink what, what it all meant. Um, you know, and I, and I compare it to the actual explosion of the Trinity bomb. Uh, there was the world before atomic power, and there was the world after, after atomic weaponry and before. There's no going back. There's no way we can go back to before 1945. There's no way we can really look at Twin Peaks the same way anymore uh, before part eight. I do think it still has the same magic it always did. I don't want to take away from, from that original series. It still, uh, I think, affects us. Uh, in the same way it did when we first watched it, but now we have something else in the back yeah. of our mind. So anyway, that's sort of my my uh, overview introduction to what part eight means. And mine would be too that I think also that it goes into this idea, and I think it does fit with the first two seasons because we have this idea of this nature and the sanctity of nature. You know, Agent Cooper with what kind of fantastic trees have you got going around here? All the stuff you know with Agent Cooper when he talks to Roger Hardy and he's talking about you know the, the sound the wind makes through the pines and all of that, and I think that this is the idea that at this point, man messed with nature. They messed with nature by taking it at the atomic particle and turning it into a weapon of mass destruction and a weapon of fear that is going to keep you know to this day people terrified that we can literally now have something we can annihilate the world, and because of that, something in the space time continuum, something in the world was torn open. Like, like, it, like it hurt the world. And when that was torn open, it allowed this darkness that's symbolic of that to come through. And it opened up this portal that I believe that uh, Judy, Zhao Day, and Bob and all those other things, I don't believe this was their entrance into the world. Mm -hmm. I believe that somehow, at some point in the past, they were sent over. I believe they're, and this goes into a whole other thing, which, I, which I'll talk about in a little bit, about the two worlds. That is kind of a theory that I've come to kind of embrace. But it allowed that to come through. And I think that Twin Peaks works really all the way through on two levels. It works that it is a story where this mythology is real within the story. But you can also look at every, every piece of mythology you can also look at as symbolic of something else. So it could be supernatural, but it also doesn't necessarily have to be. It could all be symbolic. So that'll, that's kind of my intro to part eight. So a qu question about, so the production of season three, there was a point when it was going to be just nine episodes, right? right? And then... David Lynch stepped away and then there was the whole save Twin Peaks and, you know, and then it ended up being these 18 hours. Do you think that this part eight would have been part of that or was this because of that? Uh, I know you're going to be able to talk much better about it than I, but I, I think from the interviews I've read with Mark Frost, that this was always a vital part of the story. Where it would have occurred, whether they would have waited longer if it were nine episodes to like episode six, uh, uh, whether it would have occurred in the middle, I, I don't know. But I think uh, both Lynch and Frost, uh, they grew up in a time where it was perhaps a, a little more prevalent in their world, the threat of, of nuclear war. And it, it was something that they wanted to, um, they wanted to incorporate into their arc, that, that element of their lives. So I think it was going to be there no matter what. I don't know if that answers your question. No, I, no, I agree. Mm -hmm. yeah, I agree completely with what John said. And I think that also, if you look, I think, I think that's one of these things where it actually is a perfect symbiosis of Frost and Lynch. Because um, if you look at David Lynch, you go back to Eraserhead, you'll notice the same picture of the Trinity test bomb behind Henry Spencer's bed. And I think what John said is exactly right. Both Lynch and Frost, uh, Lynch being a little bit older, he definitely grew up with, specifically with that fear, you know, living through the Cold War and that constant, you know, the, the, uh, the you know, the, uh, the bomb test in school, you know, the, and all of that. That was a part duck of Duck and cover. Exactly, duck <laughs> yeah. and cover. Yeah. That was a part of, you know, his life. Yeah. And I think that it just kind of made perfect sense that that would be 
factored into it. And of course, you know, we look at Fire Walk With Me and Bob being this, you know, elemental, evil, dark, you know, black fire, as they say in season three, you know, entity. And the fact that he literally comes down in fire. I mean, he's not in fire when we see him, but you know what I mean? Because of this, these flames of the bomb that we see. <clears throat> so I think that that fits into that whole theme quite well. And of course, then... The frog moth and the woodsman is a whole other kind of one. So I don't know if you want to go there yet. Well, I think the only thing I, I want to make sure I, I get in early on is um, I think Lynch's um, contribution to this, uh, and perhaps there was some frost in this too, but Lynch's um, uh, interest, lifestyle uh, 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 that's been defined by Hindu theology. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I was struck when I was researching Part 8 uh, and researching the entire return when I, the log lady speaks some lines to Hawk about um, what will be in the darkness that remains and Laura is the one and she says, you know, the men you're with are good, true men. They know the difference between what is and what is not. And then as I researched that, I found that that almost, you know, word for word, some of that comes from, it's not the Upanishads, it's the... I always pronounce this wrong, Bhagavad Gita, the idea of what is and what is not. And so then when I was looking at part eight, it just, the, the parallel struck me that, I think you and I agree on this, that, that the fireman sort of represents the idea of Vishnu, 100%. which is the sort of highest yep. being in Hindu mythology. Yeah. And Vishnu is, Vishnu, I am I'm not an expert, <laughs> okay? And I've been t taking the task in, in other places mm -hmm. about, why are you speaking about Hindu theology when you don't know anything about it? And so I will say that up front. Uh, but I, I did try. Lynch is. Lynch quotes from it in Catching the Big Fish. Mm -hmm. You can't ignore it. And so uh, in if, if you look at part eight, you step back from it. You try to take away the Twin Peaks and Laura Palmer. And, 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 and you look at what's happening. This bomb goes off. An alarm goes off. The fireman's like, this is a threat. I have to counter this threat. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do this action. So just on that level, uh, it matches the idea of some of what we see in, in Hindu theology is that Vishnu, when the threats on earth become the point where we really are uh, at the end of the dark ages, then he's going to send an avatar to, to earth to restart the cycle of ages. And all of those ideas are in the return. Time and time again, Laura is the one, what will be in the darkness that remains? Uh, I could go into more detail. Yeah, or you could read, read your book. I do unpack it in the book. I do yeah. go into detail and, and try. I felt very comfortable with that theory that at least I think confident enough that Lynch wanted to if not necessarily, you know, subscribe to that and say this is what is, but influenced by that, I said this works really well uh, to kind of convey the general idea. We you know we have we have Jamie E come and say we're living in a dark, dark age, yes. and the idea of of a dark age is is important. So anyway, yeah. that's that's my over overview of. of See, what's you, happening in part eight? Right? Your point about the two worlds, though. Okay. So. so here's kind of something that I've been formulating, an idea I've been formulating, which, first of all, I agree 100%. I've seen for ever since part eight, I've also, and I, my knowledge also of Hindu theology is, is limited, but I also understand Vishnu is kind of a, a force that maintains the earth in a dream, and that needs to, hence, you know, we are like the dreamer who dreams and lives inside the dream, who is the dreamer. And that... Uh, he needs to maintain balance in the universe. I don't see that, him necessarily that, that as a force. That quote comes from Hindu. We are, right. we are like the dreamer. Yes, that's, that yeah. comes to just, yeah. sorry to interrupt. That's from the, uh, from the Vedas. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> that is, yeah, that's directly from that's why Exactly, been, that's directly why, from That's why Gordon actually says, then she said the ancient phrase. Yeah. That mm -hmm. line is in there. So I think that uh, the fireman basically, he's not, and you know, that would be what, I think that we have the purple ocean, which I do believe is clearly what David Lynch refers to as the unified field, which he describes as anything that is a thing comes from there, and that that is a place of no thing or non-existent, as the evolution of the arms doppelganger calls it. So in this place, there's two structures we know about. There's what people know as the mauve room, which I believe Mark Frost has referred to as the elegant building, and then there is the fireman's castle. 
So we got these two places that are on the sea where anything can be dreamed up. Anything that is a thing can come from. So between these two places, my theory that I'm formulating is that in one of them, you've got this dark ancient force known as Jiao Dei. Over time, it's become Judy. That's who we hear pounding on in the mob room where Cooper is. That's where, you know, NATO's there. You know, Diane's trapped in this body or part of Diane's trapped in this body. Then we got, that would be what we can call part of the Black Lodge or maybe even Black Lodge proper. Then we've got the Firemen's, which to me, and I can go into this, this is a whole other idea, is clearly where Major Briggs was taken. Major Briggs', Major Briggs, Briggs experience, I believe, is very similar to what we saw Andy have. We see Major Briggs get certain pearls of things come back to him after his disappearance, the same way that Andy does. I believe Major Briggs was there, looked right up at that same thing, was given visions. When he says that he dreamed or saw the Owl Cave map after he was night fishing with Agent Cooper to Windermere, Merle, that is because he had that same experience and he saw that. So the fireman implants these things into people that are, they're going to realize later, like what happens with Andy. And uh, it's almost a cosmic chess game between these two opposing forces. Now I believe what Je with Jiao Dei wants, both of them from their places, there's two worlds I believe. What we see Cooper cross over into is Judy's world. It's the one that she controls, the darker one. Everything in Twin Peaks doubling is a theme. Doppelganger's doubling, so two worlds. And uh, when that bomb crashed, that, when the bomb went off, that allowed them to come back again into ours. And because it came back again into ours, like John was saying, the fireman has to basically dream up this idea of Laura Palmer in this golden orb, whose light is going to counter the darkness of Judy, who, takes, who, in, who invades Sarah Palmer, who has taken over Sarah Palmer, which is why Laura Palmer's light will cancel out. You know how David Lynch always says, don't, turn, don't, uh, don't you know, focus on the darkness, turn on the light. So Laura Palmer's light would extinguish that darkness. So it was once uh, daughter against father, now it's daughter against mother. That's why Cooper needs to find Laura and bring her to Sarah Palmer in order to stop Judy. And it's, uh, it's kind of this cat and mouse thing with that. But I believe that Judy, if she can, and Mr. C also thinks that he's gonna be the perfect quote unquote mate with Judy and that they're going to invade the White Lodge proper, the firemen's, and they're gonna now be able to basically control our world. Windermere had it backwards with the Black Lodge being the pace of power. He should have been looking for the White Lodge. So that's kind of a basic overview of what I think may be going on. Nobody has a definitive answer, but that's right. <laughs> we, should, we should make sure we say nobody has yeah. a definitive answer. Neither one of us. We, we, we might both be partially right, right, right. we might right. both be wrong. Totally Who knows? Right. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, I definitely like, pondered all of those, and I think you guys are very like on the mark with so much of that. But it's also interesting, I, I, I haven't had a chance to talk to too many very passionate Twin Peaks fans at length, but I'm not sure how people interpret the secret history of Twin Peaks and how much Mark Frost kind of puts in that a lot of these forces were at play long before the Trinity explosion and that there were lots of other historical events oh, yeah. that kind of were this tug of war between the two forces and certain people in our world were working to you know keep them away or those kind of things. I think what we'd have to figure out is exactly at what point was Judy, quote unquote, in our house now before? And how did she get? And if we're, and because also Mark Frost is very into history. Yeah. So we look at it from a historical standpoint of what point yeah. were they expelled and how? Yeah. It's interesting that you bring up, uh, you know, the Frost book because um, a lot of people, when they saw Part Eight, uh, and I think to this day, think this was the birth of Bob. And it certainly looks that way, and mm -hmm. I can't say that it's not. Mm -hmm. However, in Frost's book, he talks about uh, a Bob-like figure in the, in the 1800s, mm -hmm. of Lewis and Clark. Mm -hmm. And of course, in Twin Peaks, a crucial line from the first season is, you know, there's an evil out there. It's been there as long as anyone can remember. Much of the Native it, American and, and then the idea exactly. that Bob is the evil that men do. Yes. And I'm thinking, well, you know, uh, men were evil before 1945, yes, uh, and so you can't say that was the, that was the birth of Bob. What I think it is, it was a sign that now Bob is more dangerous than he perhaps has right. ever been. Right. And so mm -hmm. this is the time that the fireman has to act in a way he hadn't before. Yeah. And I think Bob potentially uh, escaped. And I hate to put two definitive, uh, you know, words around it because it is open and vague. But time and time again, Bob was coming out. Time and time again, maybe Mike was or someone was going to try to bring him back. He gets away again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, arguably, he's pulled back in and firewalk with me, and then he gets out again. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, uh, um, so, so I, I think, you know, I, I think it's. It, 
it's tricky to say that was the birth of Lala. I, I just want to yeah. say, I don't think it was the birth of Lala. I don't either. I think, I think you're right, too, that it means that he was just more powerful than he had been. At the, the atomic that, that explosion the indicates, yeah. as, as Josh said, mm -hmm. is like, whoa, now mm -hmm. this yeah. could mean the end of everything. More power and over the other world. It's a perfect and, metaphor yeah. for that. Exactly. And more evidence, too, to what John said. I've never believed it was the birth of Bob, and I remember I had a, I was having screening parties at my place when it, when it aired every week, and I remember that one, we were all blown away. And at the end, somebody said, well, so Bob was, Bob was born then, and immediately I said, no, absolutely not, for the same reason John said, it's been around here as long as, long as any of us can imagine. I just think that it allowed, that it's just symbolic of the fact that it allowed for much more evil, and because this destructive weapon allowed for so much more evil, that obviously is gonna bring Bob, being representative of that. And also, it was the birth of Bob, it's the birth of the frog moths. They're in a bunch of eggs, and we don't know where all those other eggs went. Bob is already formed in that orb. Yeah. He's not being born. Mm -hmm. well, yes, exactly right. Yeah. yeah. So that's just exactly. another point to, yeah. Yeah. to that. He was, he was sort of, uh, I, I think the way I phrase it in, in the book was he was a stowaway. Yes. He, he snuck into that <laughs> vomit <laughs> and got away. And, yes. and so, uh, so, so that explains you know what is a, a weird aside, real quick. It was, it was curious because we see Bob in that bizarre orb or whatever you want to call it um, earlier in the episode when they kind of yes. pull it out of Mr. C and initially I thought oh they're sending it back in time you know right. you know I don't think that quite works but uh, all we had to go on was what we saw in that episode mm -hmm. and uh, I was trying to you know try to find a way to tie it together but anyway um, yeah. so. And I think it's interesting also to consider just the fact that, you know, Bob is just one of what seems to be Judy's subordinates. All those people who live in the convenience store, in that lodge, with, you know, the woodsman, uh, Michelle Font, and all, all those other characters, they seem to be part of that same yeah. salon or, or right. organization or whatever you want to They're call it. They're all from, from yeah. yeah, when they talk about, you know, yeah, our world. Mm -hmm. and there's lines in the script that were that uh, are not in the missing piece, but about our, where they're referring to our world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we have descended from pure air, yes, and all of right. this stuff that they and ma even the name, the man from another place. Yep. That's literally where they're from. Yes. And uh, I just think that we have this whole kind of uh, ethereal plane that exists outside of ours, and that's where all these places exist. Mm -hmm. But that purple ocean is the basis of everything mm -hmm. within the context of Twin Peaks. Yeah. That is where everything, as David Lynch says, anything that is a thing originates from that. Mm -hmm. It's just interesting to think about the as far as time wise. Again, time is whatever in Twin Peaks, but just as far as the, the whole Trinity thing, it's like, I don't know that, you know, it's like, are these, were these entities all kind of created at the same time? Did, were they kind of brought in over different amounts of time? Just like, I don't think they were created about. necessarily. Well, well, I think they were, I think as long as there was, uh, as long as there were humans or capacity for evil, yeah. these things were there. Mm -hmm. they're, they're a part of the, uh, you know, the absurd mystery into the strange forces of existence, mm -hmm. which is also the subtitle of Ronnie Rocket. Ronnie Rocket. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Yes. And, and I think Ronnie Rocket, it's interesting you bring that up because it's, is it, it's pretty sure it's Ronnie Rocket. At the end of the script of Ronnie Rocket, there's a scene where and there's a bunch going. of eggs. Yep. And he's and, in a golden one. And, and then the one, the little girl, the little girl sitting on the lap of, mm -hmm. of, of, of the boy, of, 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 of her father. Uh, right. It, it sort of it sort yeah. of parallels the end of Firewalk with me in a way. There's yeah. some, but the line that the character says at the end of Ronnie Rocket is, "What will what will all these new worlds be?" Yeah. Or something. What will all these new universes the be? The idea born? of a rebirth. Yeah. So, and also, Ronnie. Well, spoiler alert: if anybody <laughs> cares about Ronnie Rocket being spoiled. Uh, he's going to make it you now. Year. Warning you now. Okay. <laughs> yeah, he's making it now. He's making it right now. <laughs> so at the end, the character of Ronnie dies, and as he does, he's floating up, and he basically gets encased in a golden egg. A golden egg, yeah, which is very interesting. I think a lot of Ronnie Rocket found its way. Oh, into, uh, no, no doubt. Yeah, no doubt. Into this, and a little bit of one saliva bubble too. Yeah, yeah. the stuff with Dougie is very one saliva bubble for those that have read that script. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that was an impression I got too. Nine Inch Nails appears yeah. in this episode, yeah. which is Lost Highway. You know, there's you know, mm -hmm. you have a racer head, you have black and white, you have an elephant man. You know, you have like you know, this. It seemed like there was so much that Lynch threw into this episode or just even throughout the entire series that were just nods or references oh, or sure. things to Ideas. his yeah. cat, you know, his entire works um, right. over time. You know, the Nine Inch Nails, uh, I think it functions in a, sort of on a different level uh, in that he needs to transition essentially out of this color co uh, current story of Mr. Mm -hmm. C and, and Ray and what's going on. He needs to get 
without going straight to, I mean, I know he goes back to Mr. C, Mr. C sits up, and, you know, but that blast of music, <laughs> you know, I'm not a Nine Inch Nails fan, but, um, and I know for some of you that's probably blasphemous, but uh, um, I, I think Trent Reznor's great, um, but um, it, it, it functions as a way to get us out of one mindset and into another, so you can move into that. And what's interesting about what John just said is that Trent Reznor originally wrote a different song. I mean, there was a different song he was going to use, which they wrote to be kind of more Julie Cruz-esque, yeah. more harmonious. And David Lynch said, no, no, no. Something, something angry yeah. and hard. Exactly. And yes, without a doubt. Yeah. So he was, de I think John she's is totally gone, right. She's gone. She's gone away. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Which is, you know, really functions as a reference it to Laura Palmer. Without a doubt. Yeah. yeah. And Sorry. then there's the uh, contrast with My Prayer, mm -hmm. which is more like kind of his older version of something like Just You and I, because it's the romantic thing, hoping for a lasting love. Right. But then you got all these people getting killed <laughs> yes. and menaced to the song, and you know, it's kind of like going, oh shit, uh, what do we do to, to counteract this? Which David Lynch is a master of that, where yeah. he'll take something that's a song that on its own is not ominous, mm -hmm. right. and will make it, you know, like in dreams. We'll give it a whole other context. Yeah. You mentioned the viewing parties. What was your impression after the oh. credits rolled? <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> I don't know if there was going to be, there might even be some people here that came from, uh, maybe not. Uh, but yeah, a lot of people that were Twin Peaks fans around LA would come over every week and, you know, be different crowds every time. And I remember just, and I had a rule, no talking during it. That was a big role. Like during the episode, no words allowed. There was one exception. When Cooper said, I am the FBI, people cheered. And I said, okay, exception. <laughs> but aside from that, there was a very strict no talking role. So at the end of that, I remember, you know, I turned on the lights afterwards, and everybody was just with their mouths, their jaws open. And then I said, okay, who wants to go first? And everybody was looking at me, you. Give me a second to gather my thoughts. It was stunning. I remember... The feeling I had watching that when it first aired, actually I'd had that feeling once before. When was that? that? When Cooper's Dream and the original series. Yeah. Mm -hmm. when we yeah. were watching what we thought was pretty much a network show, which was high quality network show. Mm -hmm. And then he goes to sleep and then suddenly there's Bob and there's little Mike and let's rock. And, and uh, watching that in 1990, I, my jaw opened up. Yeah. This is not television, this is something else. This is why this is great. That's the thing, that's the moment where I devoted my life to Twin Peaks. Same here, uh, actually. Yeah. And yeah. that yeah. feeling came, I never thought I'd have that feeling again. Because it's Twin Peaks now, I'm in Twin Peaks. I'm, I'm David Lynch, he's not gonna, yeah. I mean, he's gonna, he's gonna do great things and they're gonna be unexpected, but I'm not gonna have that feeling again. And then part eight comes along and I remember just sitting there in awe of it. Uh, it I was, yeah. I was, I was loving. I was loving the discomfort of it. The the yes. the, the, uh, the feeling. That I'm like I'm untethered now. I don't mm -hmm. know what's happening. I don't, and that's okay. It's such a great feeling. It's so rare. And, and my wife yes. was watching it with me, and I'm like, I don't know what happened. And I never thought I'd get here again. <laughs> yes. You know, and yes. and that was a brilliant moment. And I I'm so happy it happened again. And it felt. It was. I mean, I, I hate to use this word, but it really felt that way. It was almost magical. The feeling mm -hmm. it almost was, and I think probably a lot of people know what I'm talking about. I, I can't think of a better word. To and interesting, fans that we know, hardcore fans, were so unhappy. Yeah, with. which I was surprised by. And they were like, "This isn't Twin Peaks anymore. What is this?" Yeah, I think that's like, kind of like, just come on. But this I thought is that exactly what Twin Peaks. I thought it was. Yeah, I thought it was pure Twin Peaks. It was <laughs> right. exactly, this is exactly that. what we, we were want. getting. What we wanted to know. We were getting, you know, basically. That, that's like the highest thing that a piece of art can do for you. Yeah. I think so. Like when you find yeah. that thing, it's it's very. And when you definitely it's, know it, mm -hmm. it, then there's a turn, and then you know there's yeah. Right. Kafka right. has a line that says, "We art should hit us over the head." And uh, I'm paraphrasing it. It's, it's it's a better line than that. But the idea that we should be rattled by it, mm -hmm. yeah. um, not that everything should you know should upset us, but we should be mm -hmm. you know impacted by it. Yeah. It could be it could yeah. be feelings of wonder and feelings of you know great contentment, mm -hmm. or it could be like in this case feelings of. Um, Whoa, I don't know where I am anymore. Yeah. And clearly Showtime felt that it was worthy because they put it on the four year consideration, you know, albums that went you know, went out, right. the, the DVDs went out for folks, as part eight being one of those yeah. signature episodes. How did anything went over that. Yeah. That's what I wanted to know. <laughs> <laughs> Has there been anything like it since then? Yeah. 
Has there any been TV that's that? I think you she's know. tried yeah. a few. I think Damon Lindelof was really impacted by it when he was he was in the midst of making Watchmen at the time. Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to equate it. I love Watchmen and I love Damon Lindelof's work, but um, I can tell when I watch Watchmen when they decided they were going to make their black and white episode of Watchmen. I'm like, oh, okay, they were white. And I know that. I know that for a, almost fact because Damon Lindelof and um, um, what's his name who co-wrote it with him. Um, Jeff Jensen were at the premiere of. Uh, yes, I saw Jeff Jensen. And I, I was there. hanging out with Jeff Jensen, who I kind of knew, and then I was like, ah, oh, it's Damon Lindelof. You know, I saw and, Damon Lindelof walk and by. And so I was, I was chatting with them, and then they, were, they whispered together, and then they shot up when I'd come over. And I didn't know it at the time, but they were working on Watchmen. And, you know, it's almost like real time. You can see Twin Peaks, like, we have to make our show different yeah. now. <laughs> we have to, we have to, now we have a new bar. To, and that's exactly what Mark Frost said to me. I had seen him in Austin, Texas, before the show aired. And his book had just come out. And I had a chance to sit down with him one-on-one -on -one for 15 minutes. Uh, and I said to him, you know, Twin Peaks raised the bar when it came on in 1990. Uh, I said, but now you're in a new environment. And the bar is now up here. Yeah. Can you do? He goes. Well, we're very aware of that. <laughs> we're very aware of that. And I thought, okay, they're going to get to that bar. Yeah. They went. <laughs> so I mean, part eight. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it was a stupid question in retrospect for me to ask. Them. Yeah. <laughs> wonder, are they going to be able to change television again the way yeah. they did before? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Although yeah. some people would argue that they didn't change television because um, no one can do that. Yeah. Nobody can. I mean, Lynch was it TV or was it cinema? You know, it was I mean, cinema. it was right. You know. right. cinema. But it was cinema in the way Lynch approached it. Yeah, for sure. And it was a, its own unique. It's, in a way, it's its own unique thing. Twin Peaks is its own unique world and its own unique creation, and uh, that's why we're all here. You know. Yeah, for sure. Literally and figuratively. <laughs> yes. Well, you know what Sheriff Truman says: Twin Peaks is different, a long way from the world. You notice that? Yeah. 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 And that's exactly the way we like it. Yeah, I'd like to. Uh, I was just saying, please. Completely up to that. I had a chance you guys to see. Did do that? No, I, I would love that. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Did, did that ever happen? Like any so in Dallas, in back or? Dallas, Texas, back is where I live. So I was very lucky because it was just down the road from me. The, there's a, a just um, uh, theater there, which is just wonderful. It shows you know old films, and they did a David Lynch retrospective, and they did two weeks of David Lynch, oh, wow. and. They couldn't advertise because they'd get in trouble and they couldn't okay. charge for certain things. They showed every single Twin Peaks, oh, missing wow. everything. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. And I knew Part 8 was going to show in 4K on the big screen. Wow. And I went in and watched Part 8 on the big screen. And, and, it, and George was there. George Griffith was there. Oh, and he introduced it. That's he's awesome. so happy that he's connected to that episode. Oh, yeah. So <laughs> fun. It's so fun. George yes. was like, I'm in Part 8. I know. <laughs> and, uh, and That's so I, I, mean, I, I don't know what the legalities yeah, would exactly. be for doing that, mm -hmm. but it would, it would be amazing. amazing. It would be a discussion with Beth. Uh, <laughs> yeah, okay. to capture it as, a, as an idea. You might not be able to charge to yeah. show it. You yeah. might have to make it a free right. show. It would be incredible. That's my opinion. Yeah, <laughs> and then maybe do a panel like, like let everyone watch it in full, and then yeah. maybe do like a talking. Like, get George here. Yes, that would be great <laughs> to get George. Here. George would love it. Yeah, oh yeah, he would love to discuss it. Yeah. Is there a favorite? Yeah. Yeah. Moment from Part Eight for you? Wow! Yeah. You know what I really wow. love a part. Uh, part eight, you're gonna think this is funny uh, because there's so much in Part Eight. I love the the young couple walking up you know the what? road, and she's the actress is so good. That yeah. actress is so good, and she's she says, "I heard you were going with Mary. Mary, yep. oh, we're broken up now." And she and she stops. Says, good, good. That's good. Yeah. You know, and then they had that kiss. And she's suddenly delighted by that moment that they share. That is such a, it's that, you know, no one thinks of that in part eight. Yeah. But wow, that's such a great scene. It's lit so beautifully. Mm -hmm. Her dress is so beautiful. The way they walk up the rope. Anyway. <laughs> a corollary, oh, sorry, one, second. Uh, one corollary to that would be, I, one of my favorite moments, and it's a shot, is after that, 
when she's on the bed and the breeze is blowing and she's listening to my prayer before the woodsman starts. It's this beautiful moment of this innocence. Yes. That's right there before it's about to be corrupted. And it's just the way that it, it just captures the idea of childhood and like discovering, you know, love at first like she's doing. And, yeah. just, and then what's about to happen. It's just that shot for me is amazing. Definitely. So <clears throat> I was going to say. They find the penny with Lincoln, yeah. and then the woodsman looks like Lincoln. Yeah, <laughs> right. I, yeah, I noted yes. that. Yes. I'm curious Robert, to know what your thoughts are. Robert about Broski, that. who played the woodsman, had a career before then uh, of, um, I don't want to say impersonating, that's not the right word, but he portrayed Lincoln in various television <laughs> things and also at, at live events, fairs, yeah. and stuff. When he walked into the to the party after we'd gone in LA, I don't know if you yeah. saw him come I in. I did, yeah, he was behind he us. He walked the bus. in, and I was like, what the heck is that guy doing here? He looks like Lincoln, and, I, and I'm thinking they're gonna they're gonna have a fair that they go to. He was dressed like Lincoln. Lincoln. Yeah, yeah, right. Right. yeah, and he I'm like, uh, he's, he's, yeah. right. And so, no way to, you know. Um, but yes, there's a scene in it where the girl finds the penny. It's almost like I equate it with like finding the ring because now when she picks it up, she she yeah. damns herself. It's not bringing her uh, good luck because right after she picks it up, he descends, and. I think Lynch was metatextually acknowledging Broski as Lincoln mm -hmm. uh, and, and equating the danger of that figure, not Lincoln, Broski's character with another character. Yeah. You know, that's a bit of a stretch, but it's sure, the, I mean, those scenes happen right, like, you know, yeah. one after another. It certainly so, works. Yeah, I think it's interesting, too, because when you mentioned that it's kind of like after part eight and what happens in part eight informs so much of what comes after but also gives us all that context of what judy and all these forces are but it's interesting to think about you know because towards the end of the return they come to the point where you know it looks like they've defeated bob but at the same time it's like that becomes an almost meaningless kind of thing yes. at that point. And I don't believe you know, can defeat Bob. Can, I don't believe yeah. Bob is dead. No. Right. I think, I think right. that orb is shattered. He's temporarily you know, disabled, yeah, let's yeah, say. But beyond yeah. that, exactly. he is just one of many in the first right. place. Yeah. So it, yeah, it, it kind of informs even the ending of season three, which we could talk right. about for a week. But <laughs> yeah. it, it, it very much just gives you that feeling of like, it's not over, it's never going to be over kind of thing. Like, you, you know what else I'm reminded of? I mean, a few people bring this up. But do you, any of you remember what you were thinking just as part nine was about to start mm, because good point, yeah. I was like I don't know what to yeah. expect now, yeah. right? I don't know yeah. what I don't know where the story's going anymore. Mm -hmm. Very quickly it went back to what it was. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I'm like I I'm I'm really kind yeah. of in that mode again of absolute blank slate. I don't mm -hmm. know because it, it ends in 1956 yeah. with the horse yeah. winning in the in the in the background. That's the last shot of part yeah. eight. Like, and I was thinking, are they going to be cutting back to more of that yeah. as they go? I didn't or, know yeah. if we were going to start story over again. And the strange Laura thing Palmer's is, walking down the street or yeah. something. You know, yeah, I just yeah. didn't know. Yeah. And the I strange thing know. is, what like, other television show can do that for you? Where yeah. you're like, okay, mm -hmm. I have absolutely no idea what the next episode is. And there was that two week wait. Remember the, the two one weeks. time we had the two weeks? Oh, Fourth of July. Quick comment. Quick question. Yeah. Okay, I think the cherry on top is once the woodsman walks off from the darkness and then hearing the horse. Yeah. That's just like it's beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. It's amazing, yeah. yeah. But question is why do you think there's that time gestation for the eggs why are we jumping so many years is it to get to sarah or uh, whoever the little girl is um like why like you know when it starts ticking right. it's, it's it's always been curious like why does it take so long for the eggs like why, why was that it, a choice it, it, it may you? have been simply because they knew they wanted to at least at the very frost wanted to be overt and lynch wanted to imply right. that it was sarah palmer right. yeah uh, and so they may have realized, well, it wouldn't work if it was 1945 when the egg hatches. So we're just gonna we're gonna move it to make it have some logical sense. Right. I would I would say that right. uh, you know I believe what's going on with the frog moth. <clears throat> First of all, I don't believe the frog moth is Judy. I've heard that theory. I don't believe I don't believe Judy possesses Sarah Palmer 
until you know, after I totally agree. Yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> until <laughs> after Judy burst out of the glass box, and I think the exactly. moment where it's happening is exactly. when Sarah's watching those lions exactly. attack that water buffalo, That's attacking them at the neck. Right, which she does to the guy in the in Smokey Joe's. In the it, it, she. She gets him in the neck. He's exactly. Like yeah. Exactly. Just like that. I believe that's when it's happening. I do too. hundred yeah. percent. So, uh, but I do, but I think what the frog moth did, I think that these forces of darkness, like I said, I think of it almost as a cosmic chess game between these opposing forces, mm -hmm. which there goes the chess analogy coming back, you know, from season two. But, um, or is it it's just the age old motif from any piece of art of yeah. evil, heaven versus hell, all that, yeah. you know. So. so, yeah, so I think that the frog moth did two things. It acted as uh, these forces of darkness knew that the firemen had basically, uh, for lack of a better term, dreamed up this, you know, avatar, this, uh, this uh, in this golden orb, this force of light to counter the force of darkness. And they knew that this force was going to be born. So the frog moth almost acted as a beacon to find that, and, and the woodsman had to put everybody to sleep. And when it entered Sarah Palmer, young Sarah Palmer, she wasn't aware that it happened when she woke up, but because that was inside of her and it acted that way, that's why she had those psychic visions, I believe. That's why she was seeing Bob, why she was having these visions. That explained all of that. That's kind of what, what I think. I, I, I agree, and one of the things that I really struggled with when I was watching The Return was the idea that I had to think of Sarah Palmer now as potentially an evil entity, and I hated that. Because right. Sarah Palmer um, is a complicated character, yeah. and I can't see her in Fire Walk With Me as sort of like condoning what's happening, yeah. or the way she cries in the pilot. Yeah. Uh, None of that worked for me. When I wrote my book, I, it was one of the rare times where I was like, I'm going to try to exert my, my theory mm -hmm. onto this. Because Frost, in his interviews with David Bushman, kind of implies, yeah, she's kind of always been this thing. And I thought, you know, I, I, I'm going to try to define it, which I, I hesitate to do, that it, it was just almost like she was, um, she was a, she was a, Waiting, like mm -hmm. they were, they had prepared her yes. for an eventuality that she could be occupied later, and so Sarah is, Sarah is a victim herself, though potentially complicit mm -hmm. in, to some degree in what happens in the earlier story, but she's not evil. I can't no. buy mm -hmm. that at all, and it's a fascinating um, job that uh, Grace Zabriskie performs in that scene where she's watching the. She's watching the, the, the documentary. The, mm -hmm. It's a violent documentary, and she she's got such a great expressions on her face. She goes, she opens her eyes like this, and mm -hmm. I think that's the moment because yep. if you time it out, the thing is broken out of uh, at that moment. Yep. And the question you have to ask is, where did it go? If right. it broke free from somewhere and it's in the world. We never see it again. Where did it go? It went straight to her. Straight, I agree. And straight that, to Sarah. It's at that point that now it's found a home. Exactly. And also because Sarah Palmer. Oh, sorry. I, I just gonna say I, I almost hate saying I, you know, doing the Star Trek thing of like yeah. defining it so. But I was so troubled by Frost's almost cavalier uh, comment in there about it doesn't bother me at all that Sarah's this way. See, I just think that. See, I think the between two worlds thing. Is, have everybody seen that? Yes, on there. Critical. I think that really is critical to this. Yeah, yeah, because Sarah Palmer talks about, you know, other people. You know, they look, but they don't really. You know, they don't really. That the idea that they don't really care. They know that mm -hmm. there's an element. They almost keep away from her because they know of her history, yeah. and that she's been so lonely, just mm -hmm. in this house, just stuck here with her grief and her guilt. You know, the, the thinking, could I have done something? Could I have been more aware? Because I think there's a part of her that had a feeling, but she didn't want to admit that because how hard of a thing is that to admit what was going on in her house, that she was being drugged, that this was all happening. And I think that that just, and, you know, that just made her the... Between the, Two Worlds is essential. I recommend you, yeah. if you haven't seen it or if you haven't seen it in a while, it's, it's important for... I mean, it's, yeah. Oh, no, no. It's I, just important yeah. for that character's arc and, and psychology. Yeah. I think it's essential to this, and I think that's even more yeah. evidence, too, that... Uh, this is when this kind of started to basically open her up, essentially, to this thing coming up, getting into her. And I know this is off part eight, but I do it want to bring... It isn't, though. Oh, because, oh no, what I was going to Because say. it connects right. to what happened in part eight. Oh, not that. The yeah. next thing I'm going to say. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's definitely say, connected. Yeah. <laughs> the next thing I was going to say was uh, connected to... Was not, it's not connected to part eight. This one was. But the next thing I'm going to say isn't. Uh, everybody remember the call that Mr. C gets for claiming to be Philip Jeffries. I am quite positive that is Judy... Yeah. And that that is Judy trying to lead Mr. C into a trap, wanting so. Mr. C to basically be 
gone so Bob can come, you know, yes. can uh, basically come back to her. And that's the ultimate destructive force of evil. But I think that, uh, and also the key line in that is, uh, I missed you in New York because Mr. C built that glass box in order to trap Judy. And I'm also gonna throw out one more theory. I know I'm off part eight again, but <laughs> I also think that Tracy, when Tracy comes up there, Tracy, just like Sam, is an, unwill an un unknowing victim of Mr. C. Mm -hmm. I think Mr. C sent that guard away because like in the Frost book with the sex magic, and we see it with Diane and Cooper with their unromantic sex scene, which I believe takes them basically from this middle place directly into Judy's world. Mm -hmm. That's why it's a different motel that crosses mm -hmm. them over. Mr. C knows that can summon Judy, so he brings her in, mm -hmm. sends the guard away to literally seduce him to do that in order to trap Judy in that box. And that's why she says, I missed you in New York. She knew that. Yeah. I think you have a completely different theory, but you're no. not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Neither one of us are wrong. We don't know. Right. I know we, we, have, uh, we have time for like one more comment or so. Um, Do you want to see your turn? Or? Yeah. I do think it's interesting too. Well, I guess uh, they can read. Oh, no, oh, no, to, to consider the, the Sarah Palmer stuff. And in, I believe it's the final dossier when they kind of talk about that there were weird events that surrounded Sarah Palmer, like in the 50s and the 60s, like she could like hear alien signals, or there was just other weird stuff sure. going on. So sure. it's just interesting to kind of try to unpack what what did it really mean when the fraud moth, you know, kind of inhabited. Well, let's yeah. also say this too. We have Sarah Palmer getting the frog moth attack, and we have Leland Palmer being visited by Bob as a child. Mm -hmm. So the two parents. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, John. Yeah, there any other questions? We are. Yeah, we're 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 getting uh, we close to time. We probably, we probably could go all day uh, from this, but you know, is there any other uh, final comment uh, from anyone? If not, just want to thank uh, Pearl and Wine and Stone Wine Company here in North Bend. Uh, thank you. And um, uh, thank you to the Snoqualmie Valley Chamber of Commerce and North uh, Bend Downtown Foundation for just putting on this. I mean, look. All these folks here. This is awesome. And we're really glad that you're, uh, you're here. So thank you.